As you've heard, this service is going to be a little bit different than most. You see, 51 weekends a year, we as pastors script sermons that call you to do something. To take a step forward in your faith. To make an impact in your relationship with Jesus. But today, together, we reflect on God's call not to do, but to be. And so in keeping with our theme, our sermon today will be simply a brief meditation on Psalm 46. Psalm 46 is written in three stanzas, each of which offers us a poignant truth in the chaos of our culture today. And so as we go through our morning, listen for the voice of God in Scripture. So often I buy into the lie that I can't hear God, but then I am reminded that his whispers are evident throughout this book. So together, let's close our eyes. Let's take a deep breath. Allow the chaos and the anxieties to slip away. And listen for the whisper of your Lord. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, this is the voice of the Lord. You see, it's important to recognize that at that time, the consensus understanding of the geographical makeup of the world was that the land, quite literally, was suspended atop the ocean. You see, the Israelites, when they heard this stanza, would have been drawn to the Genesis account in which God separated the land from the sea. And they believed that God literally took the land and placed it on top of the sea, and, and it was held up by these massive stone formations. And so at that time, there was some fear that there would come a day in which those stone formations would collapse, and the world as the Israelites knew it would plummet into the foreboding and angry, crashing waves of the ocean. When I was a little boy, my family and I would uh, head to South Carolina. And we would spend time at the beach building sandcastles or splashing in the water, perhaps boogie boarding on the reasonably tame waves of the Atlantic Ocean. But I remember one year in particular, I was probably about seven or eight years old, and we found out that our trip was going to overlap with the beginning of hurricane season. In fact, no sooner than a day after we arrived, we were going to be forced to stay inside our vacation home, all five of us kids bickering amongst each other. And so my parents thought it would be a good idea to get all of our wiggles out by immediately pulling into the beach and allowing us to experience a little bit of the ocean before we were trapped inside. And so that Friday evening, we got out of the car and we ran into the waves and, and we began to have fun on the beach. But the storms came a little sooner than had we had expected. And suddenly the calm waves began to crash under the winds of the coming hurricane. As a little boy, I quickly tried to get out of the water, but I was struck by a large wave that forced me under. And I began to tumble and roll beneath the surging sea. My body was banging against the sand and rocks and shells. I thought I was drowning. I tried to pull myself up over the water to catch a breath of air, but the currents were too strong and held me under. After what felt like minutes, I was spit out 
on the sandy beach, gasping for a breath of air. You see, I think that this is a reality that most of us live in today. And while our reality may not be quite as apocalyptic as Psalm 46, in which everything that we know is collapsing into the depths of the ocean, many of us grow up feeling like we are overwhelmed by the consuming waves of our life. We feel like we are tumbling through our days just trying to catch a breath of air. We live in a culture that evaluates us on the basis of what we have done. And so there is an immense pressure to succeed and achieve. And that leads us to a destructive cycle and rhythm of work. And that work is ceaseless as it travels into the context of our home disguised as laptops and tablets. You see, we are never still. We are never alone because the incessant vibrations in our pocket are a constant reminder of the piercing opinions of others. You see, this pressure to do has so overwhelmed us that as parents, we have carefully curated the lives of our children, stacking up extracurricular after extracurricular so that one day when they will be evaluated on the basis of what they have done in their life, they will stack up against their peers. Every once in a while, we recognize the lunacy of our chaos, and we attempt to pause, only to find that the current of our culture drags us back under. It is in light of this chaos, of the surging seas of our life, that we quiet ourselves and listen for the whisper of God. Again, Still yourself and hear God's word. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. And the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob, our fortress. You see, there's a beautiful comparison in this passage. The psalmist begins by talking about the foreboding and tumultuous sea and then draws us to this image of a still and quiet stream. You see, the Israelites, having just recognized the reference to the Genesis account in which God separated the land and the sea, would also recognize this river. Genesis 2 tells us that in the middle of the Garden of Eden, there was a still stream. And from this stream, all life was nourished. In fact, at the very end of Scripture in Revelation 22, the Apostle John has a vision of heaven. And he says, emanating from the throne of God, there is a still river that heals the nations and brings life to the dead. You see, the psalmist here has juxtaposed the tumultuous chaos of earth with the tranquil peace of heaven. And so in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the fear and anxiety that is brought about in that first stanza, he reminds us that while the earth gives way and collapses into the sea, heaven rests secure. While we are tossed and turned amongst the waves, our God sits on his throne unshakable. And he offers us the hope that one day, we too will be drawn into this still and quiet place. And while it does provide hope, 
I find myself a little skeptical. I'm not all that comforted by the idea that one day at the end of my life, I will be spit out on the beaches of heaven gasping for air. It doesn't seem very peaceful to me. Well, in the midst of this anxiety, we again hear the words of our Lord. God says, come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. This is the word of the Lord. You see, God who sits on his throne surrounded by the peace and tranquility of heaven, steps off to enter into the chaos of our earth. This is a God that does not sit waiting for us to come to him, but instead he enters into the tumult of our life so that he might fight our battles for us. And in the Old Testament, he quite literally fought the battles of the Israelites alongside them so that they could recognize the power of their God when they stepped back and were still. But that same promise applies to us today. In the midst of the constant pressure to do, in the overwhelming push to achieve and be successful, God reaches in the midst of those surging waves like a loving parent and lifts his child above the sea so that he can carry them to safety, assured in his arms of protection. And so we are left asking ourselves, how do we receive this comforting hand? How do we allow God to lift us from this place? And our God says to us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, I often assume That rest is a reward that comes at the end of a job well done. That once I have figured out all of my problems, finished my projects, closed the deal, aced the test, then and only then I can pause to rest so that I might recover and do it all over again tomorrow. But the problem with this cycle of rest or this cheap substitute for Sabbath, is that in my experience, I have never done enough to pause. There's always something more to be done. We are our harshest critics. And because of that, we have entered into a rhythm of work and labor that erodes marriages. One that crumbles the foundations of our families. This rhythm of work has led to unprecedented rates of depression, suicide, and anxiety. And has quite literally stolen the childhood away from our youngest generations. Instead, what if Sabbath was intended to be a purposeful pause that allowed our God to enter into the chaos of our lives. You see, Sabbath wasn't intended to be a rest that came at the end of labor, but instead a constant reminder for us to stop, to be still, to create an intentional space that invites our Lord to leave the tranquility of heaven 
in order to enter into the tumultuous life of his children so that he might carry us from the surging seas and fight our battles for us. Cling tightly to this promise and pause one final time to reflect on God's word when he says, be still and know that I am God.